my training's in set design. Um, I went to the Yale Drama School in set design to study with Ming Cho Li. And uh, I've actually only taken one course in costume design. The rest has been monkey see, monkey do. Yeah, this is the fun part. Because you never know if it's gonna work. I'm not exactly sure when the switch happened from scenery to costumes, but I think it happened as simply as I couldn't get any jobs doing scenery when I moved to New York, and everyone needed some clothes. So, uh, I'll call William. He has something in a bag somewhere. So, that's how it began. Nine was my first uh, big musical, second musical on Broadway. It was like right out of the gate and I won this uh, Tony Award. Thinking back on it, I don't know how I, that happened, but it did change my life and uh, made me feel like, oh, I, I, guess, I guess I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm always afraid of not being able to come up with an idea. And to counteract that fear of not being able to think of something, it's why I've developed this amazing sort of blitzkrieg gathering of images. Because if you live in a cocoon like this cellar basement of mine, osmosis, it just sort of bombards you with the research and with the feeling, with the energy. and. Um, I think that helps ward off that fear of designer's block. And uh, so far, so good. The designer's block is uh, kept at bay at the moment. But it doesn't mean I don't have nightmares about it. Absolutely. You know, when I first started, I took no prisoners. In fact, my agent, she used to get these little packages. It had dimes and a Valium in it. And it was, if you're having a panic attack, call me and take a Valium. This lasted through the years up through 25 cents. So it became quarters and two Valium. I never took the Valium because I can't even take aspirin and, and not be affected. But the mere confidence of having the little packages with two quarters and two Valiums in it just was comforting to me, but it also acknowledged I was out of control. I didn't have an overview. I thought everything was life or death. And I'm going to tell you right now, that was the best way to begin. Kids starting out, it has to be life or death. I never say no to a project. I always say yes and then I figure out how to make it happen. Because one door opens another, and theater is all about relationships. And I learned that the hard way. Because when I came into this business, I had a chip on my shoulder the size of Manhattan. Growing up in New York City in the 70s, you could see it as the best of times and the worst of times. The city was bankrupt, and I lived in the South Bronx, which is a lower income neighborhood. But within the crazy, of the time, I was able to find beauty. I always was interested in what color people painted their apartments. Because in the Bronx, when a lot of the buildings were burnt down or abandoned, you can look into the windows and you can see the different colors. New York in the 70s, that was the birth of hip hop. And it changed the music we heard, the fashions, and you can still see it in my aesthetic. Graffiti, it's pretty much in everything I do, whether it's text, because I love text. I am prone to use bright, vibrant colors. So my upbringing is always a part of me. I had a friend in Los Angeles who emailed me, just said, Project Runway is looking for designers and I think you should audition. But they weren't sure that I had the right 
fit for the show because I was a costume designer. And back when I was doing the show, costume designers were thought of as a gimmick. They really didn't see us as fashion designers. So I had to go back again and really prove to them that I was a fashion designer. I learned that I have very little patience for when things don't go my way. And I think TV just amplified that. But also I learned that I can put out good work under extreme stressful situations. And if I follow my instinct, I could be successful. Great designer I knew was Charles James. I moved to the Chelsea Hotel. He lived on the sixth floor. I lived on the fourth floor. I would send him notes saying, I'd love to meet you and this, and of course, totally ignore all of them because you know, he would get that all the time. And then um, I was making a doll, and I was having trouble with the bodice, and I, something just occurred to me to write a note. And, Dear Mr. James, I'm having problems with this dress. Ten minutes later, he came to my apartment, and there was the doll, and he saw the doll, and he advised me. He thought I was going the right way. He said he was too bad it was too small. He would love to see it life-size. But that's what he said. And I said, well, we're starting with the doll. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How are you? Look where I am. You're here at Easter. The rooftop, yes. I know. What I love about it was the light. When yeah. I create, I need light. Yeah. So well, you can tell what colors things are. Exactly. And when I procrastinate, I can look at the sky. I can exactly. look at the sky. What do you mean? I clean everything. <laughs> I clean exactly. everything. Exactly. I was in fashion school. I was, I think, four, 15 to 16, maybe? And nine. You had just done nine. Oh, my goodness. And that famous lace jumpsuit that Anita Morris wore. And I remember opening the newspaper and seeing that. I was like, whoa, what is that? And I don't know why. I was so attracted to it. It just changed my, at least my idea of what costume was. Because that was more a fashion uh. piece. Now they, they hadn't done anything like that in theater before. And it got so much press. She was on David Letterman. <laughs> and I stayed up late one night just to watch her. And I think it was by using that little ruffle at the ankle and at the cuff. That's what made it not just a leotard, it gave it the sense of Guess fashion. Guess why I added it, do you know? Why did you add that? Do you, do you know no, I don't know, I'm fascinated by that story. Because the ankles were small, <gasps> and I wanted the curve to stay curvy oh. and not go pointy. Whoa. So I gave it out a little wow. flamenco energy to give it a little va 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 boom, then goes out, you know. And <laughs> she decided to go for it. Wow. So. Well, it changed her career. It did, it, 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 was, it changed all our careers. So. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm glad, I didn't realize that yeah. you, that this interested, that's interested how, you. That's, I think, the power of theater. It transcends generations, color lines, economic boundaries. Because your people are in a dark sharing a story. What's in this room? Oh, this room. Oh, you have to come see this. So this is where like the actual work ah. gets done. I have my brother. You can tell how tall you are, I'm telling you. This, this I know. Some of my favorite times with my actor is in the fitting room. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. when I get into their heads. And, and how does it start? Say a fitting, say you start with a, a what? A mirror. A mirror and yeah. underwear. And underwear. That's it. That's, <laughs> That's it. it. Mirror That's and it. underwear. Oh my goodness. Let's get everything where it needs to be, where you feel comfortable. And then I don't ask them, do you like something? I ask, my first question to an actor is, tell me about the character. Who is she? Where did you go to school? What kind of music do you oh, listen great. to? You know, are you a high heel girl? Which they all say yes. Yeah. Depending of on the matter what right. the role is. Right, right, right. What do you do when men want to wear what waists? Waistline oh, on men, period, versus contemporary. Well I well What did you do what did you do with Porgy and Bess with the waistline? Well here's the thing. And for me, sometimes it's a little tricky because I come in with these modern waists, yeah. my pants are lower on my hips, and then I'm trying to teach them or get them to wear their pants at their natural waist. Their navel, yeah, their natural the navel. waist, yeah. And that's totally, completely different mm -hmm. 
for the youth, for young people today. But I just I just make them do it. Wow. And and then when they don't want to do it, then I put a pair of suspenders on to make sure. And then it I stays at and that. then I make and sure I so, stitch them. You stitch them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. Because they'll drop it right. down. Right. I realize that men are fussier than women because we don't have a lot of different things to wear. We wear a pair of pants every day, a shirt or t-shirt or a jacket. That's what we're in every day. So that mm-hmm. that see. suit has to say everything because yes. mm. they don't have five different changes. Also, men throughout history have really been peacocks themselves too. One longs for the 17th century and Louis the Fourteenth, <laughs> because then you can, it's peacock it's uh, all alley. Peacock. It is a natural thing for men to have the plumage, all the birds, yeah, all birds, the birds and all nature, the animal, all the... nature, the men always have the, the males have the bright colors. Do you see it coming back though? Now with so much freedom with, all the, with, the, with pop culture and the performers, do you see where men are being more experimental with color? Or is it just, um, just like performers and not real I people? I wish that that were so. In fact, those skinny suits and the boys and the young gay boys yeah. and the young straight metrosexual boys. And I would love all that. I mean, I'm, you know, it's wishing. <laughs> but wishing don't make it so. I haven't done a job where I can't look back and look at something you've done. Because I remember Annie Get Your Gun was so influential because I was working at Matera's at the time, and you did all that wonderful leather, all those chaps. But they weren't like normal chaps. These were like the most beautiful chaps. Sexy chaps. <laughs> These, <laughs> but just the craftsmanship. Willa, oh, you know, is my hero. Oh, and, I know. And, and I know. sort of got me started in the business by, I saw her work on PBS in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and it just, I thought, someone can do that? That's right. a job. We can make a living out you of You can do yeah. that. I, I didn't know that that level of art could be done with, and she had done the sets and the costumes for this ballet. Wow. And it was in black and white that's on a, television. That's always the hardest I know, thing. and I just, well, it, it is hard. And I and asked it you about that once, about black, how do you do black and white yeah. and still keep it dynamic, dynamic and interesting for the audience yeah. without getting repetitive? And you, well, gave me a, you gave me an amazing... Oh. An amazing trick about the skin tones. How you bring the skin tone. You have to bring, it's not just black and white. It's not just black and white. You have to bring it because it has to, Somehow you have to soften it in. Permission to edge in. And of course, you know who did that so beautifully is Willa. She always painted skin tones into the leotards. Yes, Mm. and so you didn't know where the color was coming. See, that's... Because she wanted them to be basically naked. Yeah. Well, who doesn't? Exactly. But uh, she and so she discovered that's, that. That's, that's the key. Skin, with Sally Ann Parsons. So, Who's so and we're going to go see Willa. Oh, cool! And hopefully she'll have. I don't know whether she has sketches. You know, she's also she right at the edge of tomorrow. She's, she's amazing. She's at though. Cutting edge. You're my hero. Well, th- you're my hero. Oh, oh my goodness! Okay. <laughs> Come visit. Thank oh, you for please. giving me today. Whatever you want. I've been wearing this outfit for decades. White shirt, rep tie, navy blazer, khaki pants, um, black shoes. Now, there have been variations for some reason, deeply psychological things I have forgotten. But a wee, a wee period during the 70s, I wore blue jeans. Ooh, 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 what was I thinking? The worst thing a costume designer can wear are interesting clothes. Nothing destroys confidence like cleverly inventive clothes worn by your costume or wardrobe person because it means you are spending time thinking about yourself. You need to save all of your energy and design essence for the work. I have uh, Kendra Neb's uh, Chicago running now in its 18th year. Sometimes the fabrics are no longer available, so I have to choose other fabrics. And uh, actually, I love this. I mean, what a wonderful problem to have. Oh, the costumes are falling apart. You uh, hope the shows run forever, and, but when they don't, I try very hard to um, get the producers to give them to me. Gosh, I'm going to fabric stores and I find fabrics that I should have used in a play that ended two years ago, and I buy it. I buy the fabric. I have bins of fabric of shoulda, woulda, coulda bins that sit up there, and sometimes I reuse them. But usually I just collect them because for me it's completing a, a, a process, and I owe it to the memory of that production. It's sort of crazy, but uh, I could be on a guest episode of Hoarders. This is my concept board for Cinderella. 
I always, at the end of one show, I have one board that is just for that show and has the essence of that show, and I leave it on it, especially if it's still running. I was trying to figure out, I wanted, during the ball scene, the ballroom scene, you know, it's very aspirational. Who doesn't want to marry a prince? And I was trying to show my uh, costume houses that I wanted to see through these dresses like this. And I couldn't, I was trying to invent something, so I made this little doll, and you know what? It worked, because I was able to take the little, the little doll, and of course everyone laughed very indulgently at me, and they said, oh, William and his dolls. But here we go, and so all the ball gowns are like this. Bullets Over Broadway is a backstage musical. And uh, the story is basically no one wants to give any money except for the gangster who said, oh, I'll give you money for your show, but my girlfriend has to have a big role in it. That's the old story. In fact, it still happens today. Um, in fact, it's one of my shows right now. Anyway, because um, we're overexposed to gangsters at the moment, I just am trying to very hard to make my take on it different. I've lined them up like this because these are all the gangsters. And here's the set. And all this color is this. It's based on this Art Deco door. I like to turn them upside down because then you're not reading it. So the interesting thing to do, which is very exciting for me, is to try to keep that color, very strict color scheme. So you've got like all these gangsters on stage, but you want them all to be tied together in front of this. Well, there aren't enough colors in this. Right. And then I found this um, wonderful bug picture, 1925, which actually has little bits of green, little bits of blue, that sort of a peach. But anyway, that's, that's, the job, that's the assignment, because unlike a film, we see all these people on stage head to toe. I have to help the audience know where to look. In fact, often, on stage, I have the leading lady's understudy, in the, uh, standing next to her. Well, guess what? I've got to, as I often tell her, I say, darling, I'm so terribly sorry. I have to bury <laughs> you under a bushel. <laughs> I still wake up in the morning so excited about what I'm doing. My favorite centerpiece of my life is in the fitting room. I'm often aware of the, fa the body language in a fitting. I can always tell that aha moment. It's very exciting because then they can see themselves being transformed. I often start with vintage underwear even though no one will see it. Uh, it's like the inside of pocketbooks. I always fill pocketbooks with uh, compacts and period uh, lipstick and period uh, handkerchiefs that help someone realize this is where I am, this is what I'm doing. I was, I think I was sick. Maybe I was five or four, but I had this wonderful dog named Mantio, and she would follow me everywhere, you know, move when I moved and sit when I sat. I got a needle and thread, and I had the end of a pillowcase that was already uh, hemmed. And I remember taking, I remember this, taking the needle and thread and going in and out all the way around. I think I ran out of thread or something, I remember, and I thought, oh, I have to get around there. And I pulled it, and I invented pleating. And I put it on my dog, and I tightened it more, and it was a ruff, a ruffled collar for my dog, and <laughs> I invented it. That was my first, my first costume. I love the news. J.P. Morgan's legal hurdles expected to multiply. Wow, that's all they need. Speedy trains transform China. Well, I would think so. Blackberry. Buyout offer raises questions. Army of questions. I can't believe this. I should try to clean this thing up. It's just awful. 
And here's a, a thing on, on Julie Andrews. Um, I designed her costumes for her in one of the shows that she was. I guess the last one she did. What's so funny is that I ran around and bought a lot of stuff, you know. And she picked what she liked. And when it was all over, she asked me what happened to the rest of them. She wanted to keep them. <laughs> we did. Yes, I knew it was you. <laughs> Oh, you're dressed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to change. My, oh, don't change. <laughs> Never change. <laughs> anyway. I haven't been here in a while. Huh? I haven't been here in a while. I know. Isn't this from the Rossignol? Uh-huh. You remember that. I, I remember. I didn't even remember. I, it's crazy. Uh, I, it's when the emperor, who is on his deathbed and about to die, and uh, Rossignol sings, and then he wakes up, and so he doesn't die. And it's in color, but when I saw it, uh -huh. when I saw it on PBS broadcast, it was in black and white. Watching that made me want to become a designer. I was in art history. I was going to write books I know, I know. I mean, you are. You're, you're an intellectual. Oh, <laughs> see, <laughs> see. But, uh, well, a wannabe, everything. Later, because I didn't have a playbill, you know, it was on top, I found out that you had designed the scenery and costumes and props. So uh, you're the exact reason I wanted to do this for a living, this crazy thing we do. Uh -oh. So there, it's your fault. It's my fault. <laughs> and I did, that's the best thing I've done. <laughs> 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 William, you're such an addition to our trade, our craft, or whatever it is we do. It's a trade. It's a trade. It's a craft. It's a no, trade. no, it's an art. It's an art form. I always wanted to be an artist, so don't well, tell me. It's, don't tell me I'm so a right here, trades here, person. You know, I never studied design. No. No, I didn't know what existed. I was an artist, and I was going to be an artist, and I got a job without my portfolio at the May Company in, in L.A. And, and within two weeks, I was doing their full-page ads. I was just a, a mad success, you, you know, and making all this money. And well, I thought it was a lot of money. I think it was $45 a week. <laughs> and uh, then Paramount called. Paramount offered me $75 a oh week. My <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I said, no, I'm, ha I'm doing what I want to do. And then uh, I was telling this man sitting behind me at, at the May Company, and he said, you have to take it because not many designers get that offer. So I went. And then I thought, what am I doing here? I'm, you know, this isn't what I want to do. I'm hanging around sound stages, doing nothing. And it's all a big factory, and I'm unhappy. And I don't know. And so this woman, this stately woman, walked by me. And she saw me loitering because I, d I didn't know what I was doing there. I was just hanging around Paramount. And uh, she asked me to do some color samples for her for these sketches. And uh, it was Kariska. Then she went to the front office and that said, I want that girl to be my assistant. When I realized who she was, it wasn't just meeting designers, you know, Hollywood designers, not that great, at least not as an artist, you, you think of them as tradespeople or something. <laughs> no, no. But uh, through her, I met all these wonderful artists that she knew. Who were the, some of the artists that you, you met with, Madame Karinska? Well, Raoul Pendubois, he brought her to Paramount. Oh, I see. To do his movie, Lady in the Dark, Frenchman's Creek. Right. So I would go visit him at MGM and wait for him, and he'd be busy or something. With, and then he'd come out, and he said to me, you know who you were sitting next to? And I said, no. He said, 
Marlon Dietrich. I said, I'm sitting next to Dietrich? The whole time I didn't even look at her. Or if I didn't look at her, I didn't recognize her. You know? It's so funny. There's Balanchine. I'm sitting right next to him. And which is Raoul? Raoul That's back Raoul back here, right, the, right next to Karinska. Directly behind him. That's Raoul's boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> I tell you, it was an, an extraordinary education. If mm. I wanted to be a designer, I couldn't have picked the two most important people mm. in, in costumes and sets than Karinska and Raoul Pen Dubois. And where does Balanchine fit into this? Well, he was married to uh, an actress. So he was a stage door Johnny, or was he choreographing the movie? He was a stage door Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> he had an eye for girls. <laughs> These are ballets that I did. And you know who he is. Barishnikov. Well, he was the most beautiful dancer. Where shall I put the... Uh, out in the... Hmm? Out in the hall. Out in the hall, okay. It's fun to look at all these paints. <laughs> I've never seen you do this. Oh, look on the other side. This is a ballet. This is the bottom of a tutu. Oh, yeah. What was that? Where's the other Go part? Ahead, uh, something, that, something that wasn't worth doing. I bet you at Sotheby's it'd be worth something. You're involved in dance from the very beginning. You see the choreographer talks to you about an idea. Then he or she is working on expressing that idea in movement. And you're involved from that moment on and trying to create the idea in, through dance. And so you're, I think your involvement is deeper. Plays, of course, c can do that too, but they're pretty much, uh, well, so is dance done for an audience. But you're not aware of that as much. You're, you're involved with the idea of what the dance is about. I remember doing a play and having a fitting with two women. And uh, they had been talking about me and how little I, you know, she knows, and uh, they were really terribly superior, and, and uh, oh God, you know, what am I gonna do? So I went in, and a friend of mine came up at the fitting, and she said, oh, that's, did you read what Jonathan Miller wrote about you in the New York Times? And I said, no, I haven't had a chance to. And so I found it, it was a wonderful article. Mm. And those two bitches <laughs> who were in the play naturally saw it because he was a, their director as well as mine. And so I, that, I didn't have to defend myself at all. <laughs> there it was in print. It's always that early in your life you remember those things because you're so raw and emotional about what you're doing. Because you're so vulnerable when you're a young designer. You know, you don't know if you're so lucky to get the job and then to not, and not to shortchange the director or whoever it is. It, it's terrible, you're just, you never get over that. They have to go through it and harden themselves. It prepares you for the, your next director, your next show. And it toughens you, but also you learn from these things.
I always say three things. When you're starting out, you're a puppy dog. You're a golden retriever. You are licking with your tongue. You're so excited, you're jumping up, knocking people over. Then, the second moment in life, Shakespeare had seven ages of man, I have three. The second one is knowledge. You learn, you understand, you have knowledge, you make discerning choices, and you're a professional. The third and final stage is wisdom. And wisdom has the effect of you sit in your comfortable chair, you have your single malt scotch right at your hand, and you go, you know, maybe we just don't do that. I just hope wisdom doesn't take over.